Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Samuel Tao. I'm a professor of medical microbiology at the Medical School of the Ladoki Akitola University of Technology, Ukumosho, Southwest Nigeria. I'm also a consultant, a clinical microbiologist, and infectious disease practitioner at the University Teaching Hospital, uh, where I participate in uh, investigation and management of patients with infectious diseases. Uh, currently, I head the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory and the Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee, as well as the Infection Prevention and Control Committee of the hospital. I equally run the sexually transmitted uh, disease clinics, where I see quite a number of uh, patients with uh, venereal disease, and some of them present with uh, rashes, uh, both on the genitals as well as uh, over the body. So I'll be speaking uh, in this uh, presentation here on systemic infection syndromes presenting with uh, rash. Uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest to declare, but I want to say that uh, permission to use cooperated materials in this uh, presentation were granted. The learning objectives, one, is to summarize the main features of skin rashes, uh, systemic infections, to describe the etiology and epidemiology of rashes and systemic infections, provide a simple diagnostic approach for easy recognition of urgent systemic infection syndrome uh, underlying the, the rashes, and to evaluate patients for treatment of life-threatening infection that may be uh, uh, in this, uh, maybe underlying these rashes in a very timely manner. And so this is the outline. Uh, we'll give a brief uh, background and introduction, uh, give a morphologic description of rashes, the pathogenesis of rashes and systemic infections, and uh, how to evaluate a patient with systemic infection present, presenting with a, a rash. And of course, uh, we'll conclude. But let me say that uh, a rash may be a binga of a serious uh, systemic uh, infection or may signal a progression of a systemic infection. Uh, may, you know, perhaps may, you know, assist in a probable diagnosis based on very good clinical skills. Now, what is a rash? A rash is an eruption on the skin. Uh, that is called exanthem. Uh, many a time, this eruption may be associated with uh, a similar eruption on the mucous membrane uh, that describes as enanthem. Now, rashes are among the most frequent reasons uh, for consultations of a general practitioner, a dermatologist, or a venerologist in the clinical setting. Uh, many a times, some of these may be, like I said earlier, a binger of a very serious underlying uh, condition that may be life-threatening. So identifying this rash may assist in picking early enough any underlying uh, systemic infection that may be life-threatening for the patient. Now, the classical or typical uh, rash of childhood are very well known to uh, physicians, rashes of measles, rubella, chicken pox, scarlet fever, erythema infectiosum, rosola infarctum. All these childhood exanthems are really uh, well recognized. But there are a whole uh, gamut of uh, rashes that may occur in the adult population. Uh, many of these are called atypical or sometimes called para, para exanthems. And they are very diverse with a, a diverse etiology, including microbial etiology, like viral, bacteria, including rickettsia, parasitic, and emetic infections, and a lot of non microbial uh, origin, which are good differentia that must be excluded when you are, you know, when one is dealing with a systemic infection that may be life threatening to the patient. 
such as toxic chemicals, drugs, autoimmune disorders, all this can give rise to different kind of uh, uh, you know, exantims that may be different from what we see in the childhood illnesses. I also got morphology discipline of uh, rashes, uh, and this is just my own uh, way of uh, bringing them under such uh, categories. So you have a macula. The macula is a circumscribed uh, flat discoloration of the normal skin, uh, which is usually uh, less than one centimeter diameter, sometimes maybe more than that. There's obvious no elevation or depression when you palpate such a rash. A patch is a large macula, and a common example of a large macula is a cafeole spot, which could just be ordinary uh, bat mark in neonates. A purple is a solid palpable lesion, usually up to 0.5 cm in the greatest diameter. And a plaque is a flat top raised lesion occupying a relatively large area in terms of height as well, and is often formed by a confluence of uh, purples. A nodule is similar to a purple, but is located deeper in the dermis or the subcutaneous tissue, and usually rounded in you know, a raised lesion greater than one centimeter in diameter. A vesicle is where circumscribed elevated fluid containing lesion, which is usually most of the time will be less than 1.5 centimeter, but will be more than one centimeter in greater diameter and may be located intraepidermally or subepidermally. A bully is a large vesicle that is usually greater than one centimeter in diameter. A posture is a circumscribed elevation of skin containing prevalent uh, fluid of variable character. The fluid could be whitish, could be greenish, could be yellowish, or it could be hemorrhagic. Uh, Tikia, uh, copper, and ecchymosis are uh, described uh, bleeding under the skin. And the difference between them is in terms of the size. So uh, they may or may not be palpable, but usually they don't blanch because it's usually an extrapacitated blood into the tissue. So they don't blanch under pressure. Ecchymosis is a large area of bleeding under the skin. As distinct from erythema, erythema is also a redness, appears like uh, take care in some cases, but this blanch under pressure, and that's because it's usually uh, as a result of increased uh, blood flow into such area. An urticaria or a wheel or hive is a wet demarcated elevation that usually, you know, sometimes pink in color and usually present less than 24 hours. Of course, in some cases, it could be prolonged. In chronic infections, you could have wheel that is continuously being produced from the effect of such uh, immune reactions. The crust is a dry exudate of blood and or plasma under the skin, and uh, a hard core, what we call an eshka, is a hard crust or a scar. And then you have all manner of secondary uh, skin reactions, which is you know, uh, consequent on the primary reaction. And this usually can complicate the primary uh, lesions. So if you have scales, ulcers, excoriations, and so on. So, so these are the various morphologic description that we can have as far as rashes are concerned. It's, it's not exclusive. There are some that uh, may not be captured by what I've described here. Now, What's the pathogenesis of this rash in systemic infection? Uh, this is not well known in many cases, but in some, uh, we could attribute the rash to certain uh, event or certain conditions that is happening in the host. Now, it could be as a result of direct inoculation of an infectious agent into the cutaneous surface or dissemination of that agent from another distant site into that area of the skin. And that's what's producing the eruptions. More often than not, it could be immunological response to microbial antigens in the skin by the host uh, humora immune response or the cell mediated immune response, which can result into vasculitis uh, on the skin. It could also be attributed to disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, uh, which most of the time results in bleeding under the skin, as you see in petechia, uh, poporic, and ecchymotic uh, rashes. It could also be as a result of septic microembolization, uh, which could occur uh, from conditions like infected endocarditis, where you have vegetation that are formed on the valve, and then the, the septic emboli are released and they are trapped in the skin and they cause uh, 
skin lesion. Of course, vascular effect of microbial toxins will also be responsible. Is particular one is there's scarlet fever, antigenic toxin, and toxic toxin in toxin that we see exotoxin A. Okay, so these are some of the particulars underlying the rash that we see in systemic infection. Now, how do we evaluate patients who have systemic infection? In evaluating such patients, we need to consider some facts there. One is that diagnosis cannot be made by description of the rash alone. Uh, no skin lesion is pathognomonic for a specific pathogen. Maybe in some exceptions, like you have maybe coplic spots, which is an enantin that is uh, maybe pathognomonic of measles, or you have uh, erythema migrans that you see in Lyme disease. Uh, apart from these few exceptions, no skin lesion is pathognomonic for a specific pathogen. Skin manifestations associated with a specific infest, infectious agent may be variable. Different uh, types of skin lesions may be seen at different times in the course of the illness. So you can have evolution of different uh, types of morphology uh, description that I've highlighted in the earlier slide. And of course, the appearance of uh, eruption or skin, or skin rash may be modified greatly by the host uh, system, particularly uh, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, all this can modify the way uh, this rash is uh, uh, manifest. So evaluating such patient therefore will require that we obtain very detailed uh, history and characterize the rash during physical examination as much as possible assess the patient for life-threatening infections, consider differential diagnosis for exclusion, and of course, determine the need for empirical antimicrobial therapy uh, for a life-threatening infection that may be underlying the appearance of this rash. So let's look at the history and some ep epidemiological clues that can point to uh, the origin of this rash or what is the etiology, or what is behind this, uh, this rash. This is required to limit you know, the differential diagnosis. So you need past history of immune compromise, valvular heart disease, previous plenectomy, history of childhood illnesses, including immunization. These are very important that may point, you know, may give an idea of uh, the underlying condition. Social history, like intravenous drug use, sexual history, and this is important to, to know the underlying condition, IBD use, it's common in people with infective endocarditis, right-sided infective endocarditis. Sexual history may point to uh, the sexual origin of the rash. Season of the year, it's another epidemiological clues. Uh, some underlying conditions like tick-borne diseases are uh, usually associated with the rashes. Parvovirus infections are, uh, you know, uh, what gives rise to some rashes that uh, taking a very detailed history may give an idea of how this rash come about. And of course, geographic locations and occupational history, history of travel, exposure history, are very important in trying to find the, you know, the origin of the rash. History of medications, past and present medications, including vaccination and any adverse effects. These are important to exclude uh, differential diagnosis, uh, which may pro uh, produce rashes that may look uh, similar to some other conditions, uh, infective conditions. And of course, specific history about the rash, in terms of when and where the rash was first noticed, the nature of the rash as highlighted, the timing of the rash and associated symptoms, is the rash appearing before the prodrome or is the rash appearing after the fever uh, or after the symptom have subsided, pattern of spread, of the rash or change in rash morphology through the course of illness. Some rash will evolve from different uh, morphology type to another type, and some will spread centrifugally you know, from the trunk down to the other extremities, or may spread from the extremity centripetally to other. And that's also very important. History of pain or itching or paritus, it's equally important. Temporary relation of rash and fever. Is the rash presumably fever or is the fever subsiding before the rash comes? And that happens in quite a number of uh, conditions which we are going to highlight uh, later. And of course, the history of medication that has been attempted at the, 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 uh, at the time the patient is presenting or before the patient presented, uh, that's important because that could also modify 
the character of the rash. Now, physical examination is uh, is very important. It's necessary to highlight, you know, uh, it's necessary to highlight the you know the type of rashes. Uh, primary rash, skin rash lesions should be identified by physician, and also looking for also uh, secondary uh, lesions that uh, may complicate the primary lesion. And usually, these are the lesions that will lead to secondary bacterial infection, and so this should be highlighted. It just should be observed in very good light. Natural light is preferred, and you know, sometimes you have to palpate the rash to be able to see the different elevations that or depression that you may want to see. And usually it should be done with gloved hands because many of these rashes could be very infectious. They could con they contain infectious material that can be organisms that can be transmitted. So looking at the distribution of the rash, looking at the configuration, the arrangement of the rash, and associated uh, rash on other mucosa. Uh, uh, areas like the oral mucosa, the genital, the conjunctival lesions, and looking for secondary uh, rash uh, or secondary lesions like excoriations, tenderness, and all others that may assist in trying to uh, give you a good description of the rash and the associated uh, lesions. And then, of course, the patient should be evaluated with vital signs and the general and systemic signs. Sign of toxicity is very important because many a times. These rashes could be as a result of sepsis, and you want to look for signs of toxicity. You want to look for other systems. You want to look for adenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, neurologic signs, uh, nuca rigidity may, that may suggest there is a meningia involvement. You want to auscultate the heart, check for murmurs, which you can have in conditions like infective encarditis. Now let's look at our, you know, looking at what you know, rashes that can be associated with some systemic infectious uh, syndromes in, on our physical examination. And I put them under these seven categories. It's not exclusive. It's not, there might be others that may not fit into my, my categories. So I want to look at macropapular and patchy rash that may be seen in some systemic infectious syndrome. And I will look at differentials that we need to exclude. A tachea and purpuric uh, rash, Diffuse erythematous rash, vesiculobulous rustular rash, nodular rash, particular rash, and uh, eshka. So let's look at macropopular rash and systemic infection syndrome. These are mostly uh, due to viral exantins or immune mediated uh, syndromes, which are differential that we must exclude. Now, the distribution of the rash, whether it's a central leg distributed or it's limited to the peripheral, may aid in differential diagnosis. So we have centrally distributed macropapular rash, which occur in many systemic infections, particularly the viral exantins, measles, rubella, fifth disease, sixth disease, are common uh, viral exantins that have centrally uh, distributed macropapular rash. But we also have that in some systemic bacterial infection, like Lyme disease, uh, typhoid fever, uh, syphilis, and many others uh, that could also give rise to centrally distributed macropapular rash. And of course, there are good differentials that we must exclude because this can mimic such uh, rashes, like rashes of uh, dermatophytosis, which uh, usually could be you know, hypopigmented or could be macules, but as they would scale and uh, irritations and itching. Pterosis vesicolor is another uh, drug-related uh, skin rash. Uh, particularly uh, beta lactams like cephalosporin um, are good differential that must be excluded while we're considering the etiology of macular and systemic infections. So you can see these measles, different uh, 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 rash that you can see in measles. Measles is an acute para uh, illness that starts with a prodrome, usually lasting two to four days, fever and at least uh, what is discovered as three Cs. Coriza, conjunctivitis, and uh, cough. And that's similar to any other upper respiratory tract infection. But the characteristic rash in measles is an erythematous macropapular rash, which appears two to four days after the onset of fever. Uh, usually starts on the face and on the on the on the on the head. You see a uh, face and the head, and then they progress uh, to affect the trunk and the back, and then they spread to the extremities. Uh, through, uh, during the next uh, few days. And of course, this rash will last for like about seven days after which 
it will replace if there's no complication. So in simple, uncomplicated measles, this is the classical way that you can see rashes. And of course, this is very common in children, but it also happens in adults. Uh, complex spots is one, uh, uh, one uh, size that we look for uh, in the mouth. That's an enanti. And that's like a, almost like bluish white plaques that is found on the buccal mucosa, which is seen in 70% of cases of measles. And it's said to be pathognomonic of measles. Uh, usually, of course, one to two days before the appearance of the rash and can continue for another one to two days after the rash has appeared. Now, rubella is also similar to, to, to measles. However, the symptoms of rubella are usually uh, less severe and the rash uh, just has a shorter duration, usually about two to three days. But usually you have a, a red or pink rash on the white skin, that's how it appears. And it appears a little bit bumpy on that skin, and then you have swollen glands, usually at the back of the hair, as can be seen in the picture here. Fifth disease, it's uh, known as a uh, erythema uh, infectious, uh, which is caused by uh, human uh, virus B19, and primarily affect children between the ages of three and 12 years. And uh, of course, it can also affect adults, it's not common can affect adults as well. The common prodrome is usually fever, sore throat, uh, and resin and abdominal pain. However, once the fever resolves, that's when the rash appears. And the classical rash is described in children as a slap cheek appearance. Now was appearing as erythematous rash on both sides of the cheeks, and that's what gives it a classic description of a fifth disease. But, but you know, it's 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 usually not uh, severe. It's mild. Children tend to uh, overcome that. However, if this occurs in a pregnant woman, uh, we are still with hydroxyphetalis, uh, and that can lead to fetal death. And then you have the sixth disease, which is very similar to the fifth disease, but it's caused by human epivirus type six, and the rash here uh, tend to. Uh, also uh, appear, I mean, occur in children, but usually uh, children under three years of age. Uh, and it, you know, resolves after uh, many days. The, the rash appear after the fever has actually subsided and is usually a diffuse macropapular rash that you can see uh, typically on the trunk. The face is characteristically spared and the duration of the rash is usually less than uh, just about three days, unlike fifty disease when the rash will actually wax and wane for like about six to eight weeks. And then you have different uh, bacterial infection that result into uh, uh, erythematous, centrally distributed uh, papular rash. One example is the uh, Lyme disease. Lyme disease is, is uh, commonly reported in the United States of America. It's not common in the tropical area because the vector, uh, the tick, exotic tick is found uh, in such uh, areas. And the organism is, is parochate, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi which is transmitted by the bite of that uh, isod tick. And the pathognomonic rash of Lyme disease is erythema migrans with bull eyes rash. It's, it gives a characteristic bull eye, usually start as a maku, but can you know, you know, progress to develop into papu, usually at the site of inoculation where the bite takes place. But then that sometimes the rash will spread to affect other parts of the body. So the characteristic bull eye rash is a central clearing you have central area of clearing, and then sometimes the center can vesiculate or can ostrate. That's possible. And then there are also systemic symptoms that you have with Lyme disease, including fever, cheese, myalgia, headache, and atragia. And if it's not treated, of course, you could have uh, serious complications uh, like uh, carditis, uh, neuroborreliosis, and chronic skin lesion that is described as atrophic, uh, chronic, uh, chronic atrophicans. Acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans is a complication of Lyme disease, skin complication of Lyme disease that is not treated. Uh, enteric fever, particularly typhoid fever, is commonly caused uh, rashes. Uh, typhoid fever is caused by salmonella type, and that is septicemic illness that is characterized by gastrointestinal symptoms. But at the height of this the, 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 the illness, you know, there could be rash, which is described as rose spots, and you see it classically on the chest and the back, and it's as a result of a bacterial microemboli. 
uh, which you know uh, disseminated into the skin area and caused that cholesterol in him. If you take a point biopsy of that uh, uh, rash, you actually culture salmonella type from that uh, lesion. Uh, this can also occur in typhoid fever and even in non typhoid salmonella, but it's more commonly described in uh, typhoid uh, fever. Typhoid, you should know, is still very endemic in many developing countries. Is been likely, uh, you know, uh, uh, taken care of in developed countries because of good environmental hygiene and uh, food hygiene, which is still lacking in many uh, developing countries. And then, of course, you have uh, syphilis. Different stages of syphilis can give rise to uh, skin, manifestation, uh, skin manifestation in the form of rashes on different parts of the body, including both on the mucous membrane. Uh, syphilis is caused by Trepanoma pallidum, uh, which is also a spirochet. And usually it starts, it, it manifests as a primary stage or called primary syphilis, which is usually on the genital. So it causes uh, what we call syphilitic chancre. It starts usually as a macule, can become purple, you can uh, or straight, and then of course develop into ulcer. This is very painless, and so individuals may not even be aware of that. Uh, and so the organism can disseminate into the bloodstream. So the dissemination of the organism into the bloodstream, around the onset of secondary syphilis, with generalized manifestation, like you know, you have uh, generalized macular eruptions, which is usually on uh, you know on the on the trunk, but can also spread into the extremities. And then you have associated uh, uh, enantiums in the mouth, particularly the buccal mucosa, where you can see characteristic what is described as mucous mucous patch, or what we call uh, snake track ulcer, and can, that can be seen on the buccal mucosa. But you also have some warty growths on the genitalia that is described as condylomata lata. So these are uh, signs that you can push together, match them together to arrive that this rash is actually uh, due to secondary syphilis. And you know, this rash is very, very infectious. And so patients that have secondary syphilis with rash, as, as you can see here, it's, it's, they are highly infectious and individual, like you know, physicians or those who are handling patients uh, of this nature have to be very careful so that they don't get uh, inoculated. And then you have, these are not systemic infections, but these are important differentials. Dermatophytosis can cause a lot of skin reactions, skin eruptions. Usually they are scaly eruptions, sometimes could be purple, could be macule, uh, depending on the different type, they are generally called tinea or ringworm because of the but that they appear uh, ring in nature, uh, warm-like in nature. Also, you have tinea corporis that affect the body, tinea capitis, pedia, tinea baby, tinea uh, onguinum, and different type of uh, uh, manifestation. These are not systemic infections, but they are good differential that you must exclude. Pterosis vesicolor is uh, caused by uh, fungus molasses for that cause hypopigmented, sometimes hyperpigmented lesions all over you know, the trunk of the body and usually cosmetically uh, on site. So, but it's not uh, a systemic infection. You must explore that. Drug induced macropopular rash is also a good differential uh, to exclude. Uh, drug induced macro could be mild. So, you have a generalized rash on the trunk. It could be intense. And then you could, you could have the rash coalescing to form plaques. And these are important uh, differentials. History, good history, we exclude this because these are usually due to uh, you know, drugs like uh, beta lactams, phallosporins, uh, and they appear usually within the first week of intake of this drug. And once the drug is withdrawn, actually the rash tends to disappear. Now, those rashes, the maculopapular rash, could also be peripherally distributed. In other words, they are just found in the extremities. And these are, you know, the most commonly seen is what you discover, erythema multiform. Uh, but you can also see that in infective endocarditis, which is a very serious disease. Now, erythema multiform, the, the characteristic that looks like that of Lyme disease. It's also a bull eye, but usually the center is really dark red center. And uh, from good history, you'll be able to exclude this because the, 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 the agent, the etiology agent are different. For example, you could have a my, microbial cause like mycoplasma, Episimplex virus, and even some fungi, you have uh, erythema multiforme. And of course, a lot of drugs 
antibiotics, uh, and said anticonvulsants, and even radiation. When they see this kind of uh, you know, rashes, usually on the extremities, and this must be excluded. And then, of course, infective endocarditis is a very serious condition that uh, may manifest with many cutaneous uh, signs. Uh, infective endocarditis is inflammation of the endocardial, endocardial surface of the heart, uh, the hallmark of which is vegetation that forms on the valve. And this could be normal valve, or could be disease valve, or could be prosthetic valves. Okay, now, many manifested, you know, peripheral manifestation of infective endocarditis can help in, you know, in the etiology or even the type of endocarditis. But two particular peripheral lesions that are peripherally distributed a chain wheel lesion and post last node, which are very similar and could be confused. Okay? For example, in terms of this description, chain wheel lesion is non tender hemorrhagic uh, purple as compared to host last node, which is tender. Uh, the chain wheel lesion is regularly distributed. The host last node is to some extent regularly distributed. Both of them can affect the palms and soles of the feet, tender and hypothermal eminences of the hand. Uh, why the gainway lesion appears within, you know, from days to weeks, those last know them to persist more than that, from hours to several days, uh, or pers persist shorter than uh, gainway lesions. And the gainway lesion is actually as a result of septic microemboli from valvular lesions, and which you see in acute infective endocarditis, uh, uh, principally caused by Staphylococcus aureus. And so, the, when you take lesions of that, the organism, I mean, the, 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 it's only positive for the offending organism as compared to host last node, which is the new complex mediated. Uh, you see that more in subacute bacterial endocarditis caused by Viridian streptococca and some other uh, not highly pathogenic uh, organisms. And usually, the culture of such lesion is usually uh, negative because it's new mediated, not organisms uh, being present there. Now you have patchy rash, which patches are large macros that are typically in, in, in leprosy. Uh, leprosy is a, a chronic granulomatous disease or sometimes non-granulomatous disease that is caused by the macrobacterium lepre, which is still endemic in many low and middle income countries, uh, principally affecting the skin and the nerves. Uh, but, you know, produce a different kind of skin lesions that could be as, must also be excluded. At the same time, you must also be able to know the etiology and treat appropriately. So uh, the large macros that you see in syphilis and in a, a, a leprosy are usually uh, in indeterminate leprosy or tubercular leprosy or mid borderline leprosy. Usually lepromatous leprosy are associated with more of nodular eruptions. So you can see here, a single uh, large macula here is a patch, and this one's a double one here. You can see that this is looking, uh, could look like uh, some other uh, lesion that you think maybe there is underlying uh, systemic infections, and so you must exclude that. And of course, these are you know bad, uh, you know macros that are all uh, widely distributed. Now the second is looking at the petechia of popori crash and systemic infection. Now when you see this kind of rash. It warrants immediate evaluation to rule out life uh, threatening illness. Uh, and this, uh, there are a number of infectious conditions, but also non infectious conditions that could be responsible, like, you know, thrombotic thrombocytopenic popra or enoscholin popra, IgA vasculitis. But we're looking at the infectious condition because you need to take care of this as early as possible. And so you have bacteria that could be responsible for this kind of the many. Bucosemia is the best known characterized. And also Rocky Mountain spotted fever, capnocytophaga infections, and a number of viral infections like viral hemorrhagic fever, Coxsackie virus, Echovirus, Cytomegalovirus, Timber virus, and even in atypical measles, you could have a particular hemorrhages. And so this, you know, warrants that you, uh, uh, these patients are uh, quickly investigated. Okay, so you could see uh, meningococcal rash here, which is also uh, very important caused by um, uh, a meningitis. That's, uh, that infection occurs worldwide. That is sporadic infection worldwide. But this infection is very common in the meningitis bed, in the sub-Saharan meningitis bed, where it causes seasonal epidemics. And uh, when the pathogen uh, moves into the bloodstream from the nasopharynx, where, where they are carried, 
it results into meningocacetisemia or meningococcal meningitis or even chronic menopausemia. And of course, this can give rise to a lot of uh, prodrome, or cough as a prodrome, sore throat. And then, of course, the patient will progress to developing uh, what looks like a, a, a septicemic shock okay, with hypotensions, with, uh, you know, and then uh, this is at the point at which the petechia uh, rash appears. Could become purpuric if it's large enough, or it could become ecchymotic, depending on the stage uh, in which that patient is, is presenting uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hospital. And of course, if this is not uh, treated on time, uh, the mortality is quite uh, quite high in this kind of uh, patient. Uh, Rocky Mountain spot, uh, spotted fever is 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 one of the most common rickettsia disease that is also seen in the United States and also in uh, South America, and it is caused by rickettsia rickettsi, which is transmitted through the bite of a tick or in the contact of the tick feces uh, on the on the skin of uh, the, the host. And then uh, the prodromes include that the individual has malaria, cheese, feverish feeling, anorexia, and irritability. And then, of course, the rash appears uh, characteristically uh, multiple petechias, uh, usually uh, prominent uh, on the hand. And that's where it got its rash spotted. It makes it look like spots all over the body. So I had the spotted fever. Uh, this is uh, also a very, if it's not treated, it will result into some mortality in, in the patients. There are many other infections that will also uh, give rise to this kind of rash because of time. Uh, Varinesis, like, you know, varihemorrhagic fever, they are not specific. It's just hemorrhage that you see. So they are not specific, but from it, the history that, you know, you, you are able to elicit, you can get the underlying cause of such a uh, uh, rash. And you have the third one, the diffuse erythematous rash and systemic infections. Two important systemic infections present with diffuse erythematous rash. This is diffuse, this is different from the erythematous maculopapular rash. This is diffuse all over the body. Okay, you can see that in scarlet fever uh, caused by group A uh, hemolytic streptococcus and in toxic shock syndrome, toxin and scarlet uh, skin syndrome caused by staphylococcus aureus. But other infections like helicosis, viridian streptococcus bacteremia, Necrotizing fasciitis and toroviral infections are all uh, important infectious uh, agents that will result into diffuse erythematous rash. Non infectious differentials are also very important, particularly uh, uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis or Stephen Johnson syndrome, which is drug related, uh, generalized psoriasis, Kawasaki disease that has unknown etiology, are uh, part of what could be responsible uh, for. Uh, for diffuse erythematous rash. Now, let's talk about the scarlet fever because that's very important. Uh, this is a classic example of an erythematous rash with subsequent desquamation. And this is most common between the, uh, in children between the ages of one and 10 years, and uh, usually follow acute infection of the tonsil or of the skin by a uh, lysogenized group A uh, beta hemolytic streptococcus. So the, it is the bacteriophage that carries the gene which attacks the bacteria and transfer the gene to the bacteria and then confer on the bacteria the ability to produce erythrogenic toxins, which is what is responsible for this, the, the rash that you see in scarlet fever. And usually it begins as a fine pointed erythema on the superior trunk and the face. And of course, this quickly spreads to the extremities. And of course, it could also, you know, when you see such rash, you could, you could you, there is a particular distribution that you see under the armpit that is called pastial lines. This is also tend to be a very good diagnostic. And of course, you have tonsillopharyngitis most of the time. You have tonsillite, tonsillopharyngitis, and you have strawberry tongue. All this, you, you know, when you put them together, you'll be able to arrive at the fact that this is a scarlet fever and that a group A streptococcus is the, is the obviously involved. Now, the problem with this, apart from the acute that it, most of the time it will resolve without uh, much uh, treatment, but if it progress, then you have to you know, intervene on time. There's also a long-term uh, uh, problems with this. You develop acute rheumatic fever on a long term or post streptococcus acute gomenophytis. And so this must be treated as early as possible. Now, staphylococcus aureus is the organism responsible for the classic toxic shock syndrome toxin. I mean, substitute syndrome, syndrome, TSS. 
and the scarlet skin syndrome that we see in children. Uh, and of course, toxic shock syndrome, it is a very severe condition. It's as there with fever, hypotension, and diffuse edge to drama, you know, which is commonly found on the palms and soles of the feet with multi-organ involvement. And you have extensive desquamation, as you can see, uh, usually uh, here, but also you could have uh, conjunctivitis and erythema all over the body. Now, this uh, must be uh, treated uh, in time. Otherwise, the individual uh, uh, succumbs to uh, uh, shock and death. The scarlet skin syndrome is usually seen in children, particularly in units and infants and probably young children. Uh, if you see in adults, that adult must be immunocompromised. And this usually presents as diffuse and sometimes can be a bullous in the tiger uh, or diffuse erythema. But usually, the mucous membrane is spared in this. Uh, in this, uh, in these children, and when you do physical examination, physician, you know, trying to uh, elicit what you call necrosis design, positive necrosis design, which is a sign that when you touch the child gently, uh, the skin tend to uh, shear off or peel off. Uh, that confirms that this is a scarlet skin syndrome. And then you look at vesiculobulous pustular rashes and systemic infection. This is also very common in many systemic infections, but majorly viral infections present with chicken pox and singles caused by varicella zoster virus, M pox, smallpox, varicella, but also in bacterial infections like erysipelades, disseminated Neisseria gonococca infection, ectamide ganglionism that is seen in Cetona erigenes, and some other, even group, uh, even, uh, group A, streptococcus, vibro, fornifocus, aeromonas, are uh, uh, systemic infection in which you could see vesiculobulus, pustular. Uh, rashes. Let's look at uh, uh, chicken pox. Chicken pox uh, is caused uh, by human epivirus, of course, epizoster virus, human epivirus type 3, and is responsible for the varicella uh, chicken pox and epizoster. The same organism is responsible for these two, two lesions here that you are seeing. Now, chicken pox is very common in childhood. We know that. Uh, the, and the, the, clinical, the classical presentation is a rash, fever and general malaise. And uh, the, the, the rash typically begins on the face, scalp, and the trunk, and is usually vesicles, vesicular. Okay, it may start as a macule, but usually progress to form a papus and, uh, of course, a vesicles with edematous base. And each of these vesicles is known to present as dew drop on a rose petal. That's the characteristic description that you see here. And of course, later it, it will evolve to become a postule and then become unbalacated and subsequently form a crust or sometimes an esca uh, over a period of uh, 12 or uh, 24 hours. And of course, you may have an enantin that is formed on the, on the palate, which uh, you could elicit during physical examination. Now, shingles is, uh, is epizoster, which often occurs uh, as it is a reactivator of the virus, which uh, during the primary infection has remain dormant in the dosa root ganglia. And so epizoster is just a reactivation. Uh, and it, it could occur at any age. The, the, the main feature is the fact that it's as there with debilitating uh, pain from the vesicles, as you can see here, which of course along the dermatome. And it's really very painful. So you have post hepatic neuralgia, which is a, a long-term complication of this epizoster. Of course, you could in immunocompromised patient, this could actually disseminate all over the body, you know, affecting uh, different parts of the body. Usually that's immunocompromised uh, patients. And then you have smallpox here. Smallpox is being heard. Mpox. Mpox here is, a, is an illness that is a, caused by monkey post virus. Uh, recently, this caused an, uh, 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 an epidemic in affecting many countries of the world. Of course, that has been declared uh, uh, eradicated. I mean, declared with the pandemic. The epidemic is already declared over by the WHO. Okay, so this Mpox, you know, is transmitted, you know, from person to person. Uh, and the common symptoms include rash, which could last for like about two to four weeks. And, you know, with associated fever, you know, headache, muscle aches, and uh, lymph gland enlargement. Because the, the, the rash look more like blisters or sores and can affect 
It fills any part of the body. In fact, you could have more than a thousand drops of lesions uh, that you have. So it could affect the mucous membrane of the, of the anus, where it can cause proctitis, because the throat, the rectum, the vagina, almost every part of the body can be affected by this. Smallpox is now eradicated. It's caused by variola smallpox virus, or variola virus, which you know, as a uh, emerged several thousands of years ago and has in actually uh, killed uh, mankind uh, in, in large numbers in the past. But due to the smallpox vaccine in 1980, the World Health Organization declared smallpox eradicated. But we could still, uh, you know, so natural infection doesn't occur, but we should still have an idea of what how a smallpox differ from a chickenpox, which it can be confused with. After an equation period of you know, about between seven and 19 days, uh, the disease, the smallpox usually starts as high fever. You know, you have head and body ache and vomiting sometimes with prostration, severe prostration. And the rash usually starts as an enantium. So it starts in the mucous membrane uh, before it appears on the skin. And of course, when the rash breaks out, it forms sore and then evolves through costumes, crust, scalp over a period of and you can see the evolution in this uh, picture. You know, starting as a as a saw, and then it becomes pustules. And the, by the end of second week, most of the saw have disappeared, and they have formed a scar or scabs. And that's that's uh, how it presents. Uh, many other uh, ways by which a vesicular bullous eruption can happen in many systemic infections include spheroids, uh, which usually uh, can be systemic, but usually you see it in the hand, and you have published red indurated rash uh, that is caused by uh, erysipelotrix erysopathia, which is a gram positive uh, bacilli that starts there with such skin infection. Disseminated gonococcal infection can happen uh, from genital gon uh, gonorrhea uh, if it's not treated, particularly a young uh, lady. If it's not uh, well treated, you could have dissemination of the Neisseria gonorrhea into the bloodstream and then resulting into disseminated gonococcal. Uh, septicemia that is, you know, can cause, I say, with fever, arthritis, tenus, and ovitis, and of course, that pustular rash, you can see, usually in the, on the extremities, uh, can, can, can occur. And uh, if this is not treated, if this, can, uh, this individual is not treated, of course, it can go into gram negative shock, and uh, that could lead to death. So, this pustular rash will actually be positive in some cases if a, a punch box is taken. And you can isolate or you can do a gram stain and see gram negative uh, diplococci. Acidomonas aeruginosa causes uh, ectama gangrenosum, which is typically seen in a uh, neutropenic patient. And these rashes evolve through several states, which still become status and erythema, and then becomes a uh, uh, bullous, becomes postular, and then, you know, rupture to become uh, a, uh, an esca. Okay, so that's also, uh, but basically, the main presentation is a uh, is a full loss uh, uh, of pustular eruption. Now, nodular eruption is commonly seen in immunocompromised patients. Nodular eruptions associated with systemic infection is usually seen in immunocompromised patients. Patients like AIDS patients, hematological malignancies, patients with organ or bone marrow transplantation. And these are basically due to fungal infections, like candida, spigelos, mycor, and many of the other fungal infections associated with nodular eruption. But bacteria can also be as they would look like eruption, it can mycobacteria, for example, mycobacterium marino, that causes fish tank granuloma, mycobacterium lepre, particularly lepromatous leprosis, as they would, uh, you know, uh, with uh, nodular eruptions. Nocardia species, Bartonella ensla and Bartonella quintana, that causes bacillary angiomatosis, uh, as they would nodular eruptions. Ethema nodusum is a good differential, which is not uh, because of the organism, but because of immune mediated reaction, which may occur a consequent on the treatment of a particular lesions. So you have nodular rashes can be seen in many disseminated fungal infections, disseminated candidiasis, disseminated coccidiomycosis, disseminated uh, histoplasmosis. These rashes are not uh, pathognomonic, so you can't say this is a particular one, but these are been described in many in many patients who had disseminated fungal infection, and then uh, come, come up with rashes of this nature. Uh, nodules are 
typically seen in bacillary angiomatosis. And these are usually red nodules and they are scattered all over the body, on the neck, on the extremities. Uh, nodules can also be seen, like I, I said before, in lepromatous lepros that is widely distributed. Uh, Mycobacterium marinum that causes fish tank granoma. That is usually uh, on the hand because uh, of it's an occupational hazard for those who handle fish. Now, Erythema nodosum leprosum is a classical example of uh, a nodular reaction, but this is usually not as a result of the Mycobacterium lepre, but as a result of treatment that is initiated for the antimicrobial, uh, for the uh, leprosy, uh, like drugs like Dapsone or Rifampicin sometimes will lead to type 3 uh, hypersensitivity reaction with immune complex deposition. And then you have the rashes develop in a massive form on the skin. So this is a good differential uh, when you are considering etiology of uh, nodular rash and systemic infection. Now, let's look at urticaria rash. Urticaria eruptions are rarely associated with active infections. But in some viral infections, you could see urticaria eruptions in terms of wheel and hive. Hepat For example, 25% of patients with hepatitis B virus tend to pre present with serum sickness-like reaction with urticaria eruptions uh, on the skin and it could be all over the body sometimes, also in hepatitis C virus. And others like uh, human immunodeficiency virus, enteroviruses, infectious mononucleosis, all these are possible to give urticaria reaction. From time to time, you could have it, it you know, could be recurrent. Then you have parasitic infections, in fact, most parasitic infections that have that with systemic effect tend to give uh, rise to uh, urticaria rash uh, from allergic reaction. For example, acute histomiasis, uh, you could have allergic reaction. Usually at uh, the point where the, 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 uh, the organism, the infective form, uh, for pigs, they can enter the host, but also during the migration of the cystosomula, you could have allergic reactions, and the patient will come down with a wheels, filariasis, particularly lua lua. It's one of those that can give rise to that. Trichinosis and cystisarcosis, particularly hydratisis, if such cyst ruptures can give rise to serious anaphylactic reaction with urticaria eruption all over the body. And of course, anisakiasis, because by anisakis, anisakis is a simplex. Uh, can, which is a fish, uh, a fish uh, parasite, can be responsible for particular rash that is generalized all over the body. And of course, we have Eshka in many systemic infections that present with Eshka, which is usually a scar or an area of uh, necrosis on the screen. The primary lesion is usually a purple, which may go unnoticed. And then, of course, progresses to form vesicles, also, and then you have a uh, Esca. And you can see that in quite a number of conditions like tularemia caused by uh, Francisella uh, tularensis, anthrax, which is caused by bastard anthrax, uh, the toxins cause toxic and anthrax complex and cause, uh, you know, uh, destruction of the, the, the skin and then resulting in a, in a edge cutting for rickettsia pox caused by rickettsia carry is also known to be associated with a, with a edge cut. And I, I, as I mentioned earlier, pseudomonas originals are ectama ganglionism ends up in, in, uh, uh, in terms of Eshka in form. Now, this is a simple algorithm for clinical evaluation of patients with systemic infection presenting with petechia rash. And I think petechia rash because, as, like I told you, this is usually a life-threatening condition. And so if you have an individual that comes to your clinic as fever and petechia rash, depending on where you are, your location, if the candidate or the individual has toxic unstable vital signs, of course, you need to hospitalize that individual, perform blood culture, and start your empirical therapy based on your good history and your local susceptibility pattern, if you have one. So if you have history, for example, of spring or summer travel to Southeast or South Central US, for example, that's where you have a lot of, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the, the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, that's where you have the vector. So you want to uh, begin to treat with that. In the absence of that, you probably want to start with menucosemia as when you see this kind of a uh, patient. Or if there is history of asplenia, you may be looking at treating for uh, uh, strep pneumo or hemophilus influenza because these are also organisms that, you know, you see, you know, 
there are capsulated organisms that somebody that has is plenia will not be able to take care of it easily. And so you may want to treat for that. Though they may not be even be associated with rash, but if you see rash in them, although they are not a major cause of rash there, you may want to treat if you have such history. There is issue of dog exposure. Dog exposure, for example, you may want to treat for uh, Capnosa tofaga because that's a, an infection that will occur with a present with fever and particular rash. And if there is history of valvular heart disease, of course, you want to treat for uh, staph oral endocarditis. Any on the other lesion that you may be able to do elicit uh, or uh, obtain from the from the patient. That will determine whether you want to treat for viridian streptococcal endocarditis also. Now, what's the role of laboratory in all that we have been seeing? Now, during initial evaluation of uh, patients with uh, a rash, uh, with systemic infection presenting with rash, laboratories that are not usually available. However, you must uh, try as much as possible to support your clinical observation with general laboratory data. So, if you have general laboratory results like complete blood count and depression, a dress segmentation rate, blood chemistry panels, liver function tests, and even blood or urine culture, because this may help in identifying the disease process or identifying even the microbial pathogen. You may need to take uh, aspirates or scrapings or postules, and then you take that for a simple gram stain that may give information a lot. And then, of course, culture, which may help in identifying the etiologic agent. In some cases, you may have to do biopsy of non healing purpuric lesions, or dermal nodules, or ulcers, and for specific histologic diagnosis, or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, epistemplex virus, deep fungal infection, or many other. And of course, serology, which may not be useful in the acute phase, but may help in confirming some underlying conditions like HIV, like uh, syphilis, which you cannot culture them, uh, blood culture or other culture in the lab. They also may assist in excluding non infectious differential like uh, SLEs, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and all of, all of that. Now, in terms of therapeutic and uh, preventive management, you know, the key to therapy is utilizing acute characterization of the run, thorough history and physical examination of patients, because that's what will help you to narrow down the clear diagnosis. But priority should be given to patients with systemic infection who are unstable or who are immunocompromised, so that they can receive empirical antimicrobial for any life threatening infection that you must have elicited during your history and clinical examination. Of course, isolation of certain patients and or treatment of their contact may be an important public health measure to prevent spread uh, or an outbreak in, in the environment. And of course, standard precaution must be taken at all times. And sometimes additional precautions or transgenic outcome may be necessary as an important IPZ measure. Now, this is a summary of some life threatening infections that are present with rash. Just giving you an overview of you know, the most important that I think in the order that I think about. So, you look at the infection, the skin rash, the histology, historical clues that can give you an idea, the diagnosis, treatment, and isolation, the need for isolation or not. And I've gone through many glucosemia, rocky, I mean, uh, rocky mantis, but a fever, glucosis, septic. Capnocytophaga, gram negative bacilli, Hebrew. And so this table is a summary of all that I've given, looking at those important uh, uh, life threatening infections uh, that present with rash and uh, fever. Yeah, so, concluding, the rash may be an early clue to an underlying infection, it could be a hallmark of contagious disease, uh, could be the first sign of a life threatening infection. Now, so diagnosis cannot be made by mere description of the rash alone, as no one skin lesion is pathognomonic of a disease process or a microbial agent. Now, so the key uh, to evaluating this patient include that you have a detailed history as highlighted, characterizing the rash as much as possible, assessing the patient for life-threatening infection, and excluding you know, some important differentials, uh, and of course, determining in the patient the need for enterica, empirical antimicrobial therapy uh, of any life threatening infection that may be present or may be underlying the rash. So these are my references. Uh, thank you uh, for listening.